Well, thank you, Eric and Ricky, for leading us in that, giving us a chance to participate. And the ladies, you sounded really good, I thought. But guys, <laughs> pretty awesome, I think, us guys. <laughs> well, one of our sons is a student at the University of Minnesota. And a couple of months ago, after being home for spring break, he needed to make the 400-mile drive back to Minneapolis. And he was going to leave very early in the morning one morning, and it had snowed the night before, and it was very cold. And so uh, right before he left to jump into his beautiful 1999 uh, Mercury um, Mountaineer to drive back up there, um, I just talked with him and did what every parent does. I said, hey, um, snowed last night, it's really cold, so be extra careful because the roads are likely to be icy and slippery. He promised he'd be careful and he took off in his mountaineer. Well, about an hour later, I get a call on my cell phone and it's my son and he told me he was uh, stuck in a ditch outside of Rockford. Uh, after sure, making sure he was okay, you know, because I knew the roads were going to be icy and slick. Um, I got the story, or at least most of it. He said he was just driving along being careful because it was icy and slick. And uh, somebody uh, switched lanes in front of him. He just touched the brakes and skidded and skidded right off the road uh, backwards into the ditch. And it was stuck. And later I found out that that skid also involved a 360 degree spin but he didn't say that at that moment, um, found it out later. Uh, so I was glad he was okay, that it wasn't worse, and so I told him to call AAA to see if they could come pull him out. But I warned him it could take several hours because I'm sure there were lots of cars off the road because after all, it was icy and the roads were probably slick <laughs> all over. <laughs> you know, just, anyway. So to keep, I told him to just keep the engine running uh, as long as you can, stay warm and wait. I told him to let me know when he heard back from AAA. So about 15 minutes later, he calls back on my cell phone to say he had called AAA, and they told him they could have our tow truck out there to him in an hour or so um, because lots of cars were stuck because it was icy and slick. Um, <laughs> and while we were talking then, I heard something in the background. I couldn't quite make out what was happening, and I heard him kind of turn away from the phone to speak away from the phone because it was kind of garbled, but uh, I heard him say something like, I'm okay, AAA is coming. And then there was another voice I couldn't quite make out. And then my son suddenly says to me, hang on, Dad, I'll call you right back. And it went dead. So I said, I waited. 15 minutes after that, he calls me back and he said, he's back on the road and everything is fine. I said, well, what happened? He said, while he was talking to me on the phone, um, a big pickup truck rumbled up on the side of the road on the shoulder right where he was stuck. And uh, the driver was a woman uh, who looked to be in her early 30s, uh, wearing a Green Bay Packer hat, and she asked him if she could help. He said, well, I've already called AAA. They'll be here in a while. She goes, well, I, I think I can pull you out right now. And so this total stranger, a lady wearing a Green Bay Packer hat and maybe a jacket as well, jumped out of her truck, pulled out some chains, crawled underneath his mountaineer in the snow, hooked him up, and used her truck to drag him right back onto the road, and he got driving again. Total stranger. She didn't want any money. Uh, he never even got her name. She just came alongside and offered to help. Now, I start with that story because today we begin a nine-week series called the Holy Spirit. And you're probably thinking, what's the Holy Spirit got to do with a lady wearing a Packer hat, big truck? Well, I'm glad you asked because that's exactly what I want you to be thinking right now. A few years ago, a pastor named Francis Chan wrote a book entitled The Forgotten God. It was a book about the Holy Spirit. And in that book, he writes, while no Christian would deny his existence, the Holy Spirit, I'm willing to bet that millions of churchgoers across America cannot confidently say they have experienced his presence or action in their lives over the past year, and many of them do not believe they can. Now, that's a pretty strong statement. The way I would say it would be that we may not necessarily have forgotten the Holy Spirit, as much as we've misunderstood or maybe misidentified the Holy Spirit. When some of us hear the phrase, Holy Spirit, we think of the, the weird stuff we've seen on TV. You know, the faith healers, the snake handlers down in Tennessee, the emotionalism, people falling down in worship services. Oh, we think of people who see the face of Jesus in their breakfast toast or maybe get a message in their alphabet cereal. As one pastor said, we tend to think of the Holy Spirit like that weird uncle who shows up at family events and makes everybody uncomfortable. 
Or some of us think of sort of the spiritual superstars. You know, people who pray on their knees for hours every day and seem to hear from God. God speaks to them daily. And they tell us about it. These people are way more spiritual than we are. Or maybe we just don't quite understand. We've never heard the Holy Spirit really explained in a way that makes sense to us. And we certainly don't think of the Holy Spirit as a lady wearing a Packer hat in a big pickup truck. Now we're doing this series because we want to make sure that here at Chapel Street Church, we don't confuse people or mislead people. We want to make sure, as best we can, that you understand who the Holy Spirit is, what the Holy Spirit does, and how you can experience the Holy Spirit in your life. Now, last week was Easter, and we remembered and celebrated the very center of our faith. We had 13 services over four days, from our communion services to our celebration of the resurrection services, and we, all, we remembered the death and resurrection of our Lord. Now, the passage we begin with in this series comes to us from John chapter 14, and we're actually backtracking just a bit in the timeline. We're going back to the night before the crucifixion. It's during the Last Supper. Jesus is actually preparing his disciples for what he knows is going to happen. All right? That's the setting. We're in John chapter 14, so listen and watch the screen as I read. Jesus is speaking. He says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. So the first thing I want us to see as we begin the series is the promise the promise of the Son through the Father. The promise. When our boys were uh, very young, they went through, one of them uh, went, a particular, went through a particularly difficult time of separation anxiety. Some of you uh, uh, know what that is or are experiencing it maybe right now with one of your little ones. But separation anxiety uh, refers to excessive fear or anxiety about separation from home or from um, an attachment figure, a significant loved one, a mom and dad. Specifically in our case, um, this son did not like to be left in the toddler room at church on Sunday morning, which was a problem because as a family, we were in church every Sunday morning. In those days, we just had the South Street campus, and since I was pastor, the task of, and I was there early preparing and all that, uh, the task of dropping the boys off at their Sunday school classes fell to my wife, Lorene. For some reason, one Sunday, um, and I can't remember exactly why, um, it was my job. Maybe she was um, playing her flute in an ensemble, was rehearsing, maybe she was out of town, I can't remember what. But it was my job to drop the boys off, and I wasn't used to it. But she had prepared me very well. Now, when you take this one to this room, this is what's going to happen. He's going to get upset. He's going to start to cry. But just leave him quickly. The staff there knows our wonderful volunteers in children's ministry are trained. They know him. They know his situation. They know, and they'll take care of him, and he'll settle down just after you leave. But you got to leave. But nothing really prepared me for the actual experience of dropping that child off. There's nothing that really prepares you for your child screaming, don't leave me, don't leave me, and, and reaching out and reaching out for you. And I stood paralyzed at the door, <laughs> and the staff there was going, Pastor Brian, you can leave. Please leave. And I'm just standing there. He's crying for me. He's reaching out to me. I'm needed, you know. And then there was another son, a little bit older, who was used to the whole routine. He was like four, like five. And he was standing there holding on to this hand. And I'm looking at this son here. And this son here starts pulling me away. And he says in kind of this offhanded way, come on, Dad. He'll be fine. Here in John 14, Jesus is with his disciples in what we call the last summer. He knows what's coming because earlier in chapter 14, he had been talking about heaven. He had said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that, you, that where I am you may be also. So he's talking about leaving them, meaning that his death 
is very near. The disciples are understandably afraid and confused. In a sense, they're experiencing a kind of separation anxiety, and they don't understand it. So it's in this setting that Jesus says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. Now, the first thing I want you to notice here is that we actually see the Trinity in this remarkable verse. Look again, and I... That's Jesus the Son. We'll ask the Father. That's God the Father. And he will give you another helper. That's the Holy Spirit. Now, before we dig into the specifics of this text, I need to talk just a little bit about the Trinity. From cover to cover, the Bible tells us that God has chosen to reveal himself in three distinct persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now, pastors and theologians have used all kinds of everyday illustrations to try to explain the nature of the Trinity. For example, like three parts of an egg. You know, the, the, the shell, the white, and the yolk. Or maybe like the three states of H2O, water, ice, and vapor. Or maybe like the sun that gives off light, heat, and radiation. Or maybe the three dimensions of a book, length, width, height. But all these analogies eventually kind of fall short. So then we try to get really precise, theologically speaking. And we go back, for example, to the Athanasian Creed, which dates back to the 5th century. The fullest treatment in detail of the nature of the Trinity. Listen to this part of it. We worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the substance. For the person of the Father is one, of the Son another, or of the Spirit another. But the divinity of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit is one, the glory equal and the majesty equal. Such as is the Father, so also is the Son, and such is the Holy Spirit. The Father is uncreated, the Son is uncreated, the Holy Spirit is uncreated. The Father, you, you've tracking with this so far? The Father is infinite. The Son is infinite. The Holy Spirit is infinite. The Father is eternal. The Son is eternal. The Holy Spirit is eternal. And yet, there are not three eternal beings, but one eternal being. What? Can we just go back to the egg? Right? In his book, Jesus Continued, a writer named J.D. Greer says it simply. He says, the mystery of the Trinity is that only one God exists in three persons. Mystery. Years ago, I was interviewing with a search committee right here at our church to become senior pastor. And um, during the interview, one of the search committee members asked a question that, was, that I was not at all prepared for. Uh, and the question was, he said, uh, how do you experience the Trinity in your everyday life? And I think I said, uh, could, could you repeat the question? <laughs> how do you experience the Trinity in your everyday life? And just off, the, off thinking on my feet, off the top of my head, I, all these people listening to me, I, I did the best I could. And this is what I, I said something like this. Well, I worship God the Father as creator of all things. I follow Jesus, who's my Lord and Savior, and I have a relationship with God through the Holy Spirit. That's the best I could do at the moment. Again, J.D. Greer says it this way, the Holy Spirit is how God is present with us today. The Holy Spirit is how we experience relationship with God. But as we begin, I want you to see the most important thing to understand is that the Holy Spirit is not an impersonal force like Star Wars. Uh, the Holy Spirit is not team spirit or national spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit is not an emotion although the Holy Spirit has emotions and can produce emotion. The Holy Spirit, according to the Bible, is a person. One of the three persons of the Trinity. And we actually see the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, from the very beginning of the Bible. Now I want you to stick with me here. I'm going to do a quick tour de force of Scripture here. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. The Hebrew word for spirit in the Old Testament is ruah. And it can be translated as spirit or breath or wind. So the Spirit of God is the breath or wind of God. And the Spirit of God participated in the creation of all things. 
Then in Genesis 1.26 we read, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. You see that? Let us make man in our image. Question, who's the us? Who else is around? Well, God is referring to himself in the plural. Because from the very beginning, God has existed in three persons in relationship to himself. That's the mystery. Now, the Spirit is also promised through the prophets. The Bible says God sp spoke through the prophet Ezekiel and says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Then in Joel, God says, and afterward I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Then Jesus repeats this promise here in John 14, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper. The second thing we see is that the helper, which is Jesus' name for the Holy Spirit, is so important that it's one of the very last things he tells the disciples before his death. He gives them a promise. And then we see that promise fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. It says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly it sounded like the blowing of a violent wind. Remember Ruah, the breath of God? Came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. We'll teach on that passage in just a few weeks. That promise is then fulfilled in each one of us personally when we put our faith in Christ. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing your inheritance. So, here's the summary. The Holy Spirit was there in the beginning, the Holy Spirit was promised throughout the Old Testament prophets. The Holy Spirit was promised by Jesus himself. And Paul says the moment we trust Christ, the Holy Spirit indwells us, marking us as belonging to God and making himself at home in our hearts. Here's what we need to see. The Holy Spirit, the helper, is not the weird uncle who shows up at family gatherings and makes us all uncomfortable. The Holy Spirit is not just for the super saintly among us. The Holy Spirit is promised, promised to all who put their faith in Christ. Now, what does the Holy Spirit do? Second point today is the promise of a helper. The promise of a helper. One of the great responsibilities and joys of being a dad, and many of you have experienced this, is teaching your kids to ride a bicycle, ride a two-wheeler. I love scenes like this. In fact, whenever, uh, every so often, I'll see a young dad uh, running alongside a son or daughter in a neighborhood as I'm driving around, and if I see that, uh, I, I sometimes will just stop my car and just watch. Watch that scene unfold. Something about it that just touches me. I have fuzzy memories of my own dad teaching me how to ride a bike somewhere between age four and five or so. Very fuzzy memories. He started me at the top of our front yard. Our house at the time, as I recall, had a front yard that sloped down toward the street in front of our house. Uh, there was also a, a big bush that was right next to our mailbox. I think it was the only bush in the whole yard, but it was right next to the driving next to the mailbox. So he started me at the top of the, of the lawn and just set me off down the hill. And I stayed upright, was, was going down the hill, but I didn't really understand how to turn the bike, and I rode straight into that bush. But evidently it worked because eventually I learned to ride a two-wheeler. So when our boys were ready to learn, I used a similar strategy, a little bit different without the giant bush at the end of the driveway. I uh, started them on training wheels just for a couple of weeks, not too long so they got used to it, and then took them out to the backyard. Um, and I did that for a couple of reasons. First, because I could start them in grass of the backyard because I found that the grass provided just enough resistance to let them get their balance, uh, kept them from going too fast, too quickly, and if they fell, it was a little softer. Uh, secondly, our backyard had a very slight slope, just enough to get them a little momentum without going too quick, too fast. And thirdly, we, did, we, had, we had no giant bushes in our backyard, so I started, started them back there. After a few dozen runs in the backyard, uh, I, I was pretty sure they'd figured out how to keep their balance, so took them out to the sidewalk. And that was a big step, right? Because the sidewalk was hard and smooth and they could go faster 
Also, the risk of falling was, was there. It was harder. So I would run alongside, uh, usually with my hand on the back of the seat. And you know, you've seen the scene. I'm running alongside as fast as I can to stay next to them, whispering to them, telling them what to do, telling them how to keep their balance, telling them when to turn and all that, helping them, making sure they didn't fall over. And if they did, I would catch them or keep them from getting hurt too badly. And if they fell, I'd, I'd encourage them, get them back on the bike again. So before long, they're zooming around the neighborhood. But I think that's, a picture of what was in Jesus' mind when he calls the Holy Spirit the helper. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. The word translated here as helper is the Greek word parakleton, which is a very unique word and difficult to translate into English. It only occurs five times in the entire New Testament for them in John 14 through 16, one of them in 1 John, later in the New Testament. When Paul, the apostle, refers to the Holy Spirit, he uses those two direct words, translated hagia holy and pneuma spirit or wind. But here Jesus uses parakleton, as if he's giving the Holy Spirit a name, a name that directly corresponds to his purpose and activity. Now, if you have a different translation of the Bible, and you're home reading, you may see words like, comforter. Some translations say comforter. Some say counselor. Some say advocate. And all those words are accurate in their own way. The word literally means one who comes alongside to help. One who comes alongside to help. Notice also Jesus says he'll send you another helper. Simple word, another helper. First, he's saying we've already, we've already had one helper, that's Jesus himself. And then there were two words that he could have used for another. One word was heteros, means another of a different kind, like, uh, I, like I have a car, it's a Ford, and I want a different car, I want a Chevy. Another of a different kind. But the other word for another was meant one of the same kind. I have a Ford, I want another one. Another Ford, just like that one. That's the word he uses here for another helper. In other words, Jesus is describing the Holy Spirit as a helper who will come who's just like me. So the Holy Spirit is to take the place of Jesus who they knew in the flesh in the lives of the disciples and in our lives. In fact, Jesus goes on to say, in John chapter 16, but very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate, the helper, will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. We'll talk more about that next week, but for today I want you to see that Jesus wants us to know that the Holy Spirit is sent as our helper to be with us. Verse 16, again, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. And that leads us to the third thing today that is the promise of presence. The promise of presence. Uh, if you've heard me speak any length of time, you know that I grew up in a pastor's home. I grew up in the church and one of the great blessings of my life, I say quite often, is that I can't remember a single day in my life when I didn't know about Jesus. It's a great blessing. I knew early on that Jesus loved me, knew that he died on the cross for my sins. I knew that Jesus had come into my heart at age eight when I knelt with my mother in our living room and prayed. But as I grew older, I understood more and more about my faith. I came to understand the promise and person of the Holy Spirit in my life. When I was about... 25 years old, I was working my way through grad school. I'd not yet decided to go to seminary, um, living and working at Taylor University down in Indiana and in one of my favorite places to pray in those days. I think we all developed sort of favorite places for prayer and one of my favorite places was, was down um, by what was called Taylor Lake at the time. It's really like a big pond on campus and I would go and sit in a lifeguard chair there at night and just pray. It was just, it was just a, a, a sweet place for me. And one night I walked there, I was sitting on the lifeguard chair and praying. And I was at kind of a crossroads in my life, uh, trying to decide what my next step should be and not yet found a life partner. So I had lots to pray about. And I remember sitting by myself in the darkness for maybe, I don't know, 45 minutes, an hour, uh, just sitting there looking out at the dark lake, the starry sky, praying on and off, praying on and off, wondering if my prayers are being heard, wondering if I'm praying the right thing for the right things. So after an hour or so, I, I just got down off the chair, um, no dramatic answers, no voices, 
uh, just climbed down and started to walk, turn and walk away from the lake toward where I was living. And I took just a few steps away from the lifeguard, lifeguard chair, and I, I just all of a sudden felt this kind of enormous presence. It's the best way I can explain it. Like this enormous presence rushing up behind me. So I turned around. I could almost hear this presence behind me, so startling that I turned around in the darkness by myself to see who it was or what it was that had come up right behind me. Nothing, just the lake, stars. And in that moment, I, what was impressed upon me, not a voice out loud, but what I've come since to learn was the Holy Spirit, said, I'm right here. I'm with you, and then I will always be with you. And I hesitate to tell that story today. I, I don't tell it very often because it's, it was uniquely personal, and I'm not telling it as a sort of a litmus test of the way you must experience the Holy Spirit. I'm telling it just because it was my story at a crucial time, and I think it's what Jesus was promising Verse 16, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. Notice the verses in red, the words in red, to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. See, Jesus promised to ask the Father to send another helper. That helper is the Holy Spirit who comes to live in us as a gift of faith in Jesus. He says, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. Why? For he dwells with you and will be in you. In other words, when we know Jesus by faith, we know the Holy Spirit. Now, over the next eight weeks, we are going to see that the Holy Spirit according to Scripture, has many roles and purposes in our lives. To teach and to guide, to remind that we are children of God, that we belong to Him, to convict, to empower. But today, I want you to see the first purpose of the Helper is to be with you. To be with you. Here's the promise of Jesus. The Holy Spirit is the one who indwells and enables us to know the presence of Christ. The Holy Spirit is the one in, by whom we experience relationship with God. And here are the key questions as we start that I want you to ask yourself, let rumble around in your mind and heart. Do you know and believe the Holy Spirit is God? Do you know and believe the Holy Spirit is promised to all believers to you if you put your faith in Christ? Do you know and believe that the Holy Spirit is the presence of Jesus in you? And do you know the Holy Spirit is your helper? One who helps. I hope you'll stay with us all the way through. Don't miss a single message in this series because God has important things to teach us. Will you bow with me as I close? Lord, how we thank you for your word today. We thank you for your promise. Your promise not to leave us alone. Your promise to send the helper, your Holy Spirit, to be with us, to dwell in us. And so today I ask you, Holy Spirit, to be our helper, to be our teacher, to be our guide, and that we would know your presence and know your comfort and know your truth. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.